Following the collapse of the institute at the hands of the Minutemen, the idea of a new provisional Commonwealth government was proposed. Approved and backed by the leaders of the three major cities in the region, as well as several other settlements, the government began to take shape. Of the people, for the people. The Brotherhood of Steel gave its tepid support to the formation of a new government for the region. They would not however directly support or contribute to the government, but instead took on an advisory role. Because of the lack of an organized security force, the Commonwealth was wide open to attack by raiders, super mutants, and mercenary groups. The biggest security problem at this time was the mercenary company known as the Gunners. The Gunner Company had appeared in the Commonwealth region several years earlier. The mercenaries made themselves notorious for the brutal tactics that they employed, and a reputation for taking anything of value with little regard to the damage that they caused, or casualties that they inflicted. Attempts to deal with them diplomatically had been repeatedly and brutally rebuffed at every turn. Preston Garvey of the Minutemen, urged the new Commonwealth government to declare the Gunners a hostile foreign power, and to authorize the Minutemen to expel them by force. We'll show these Gunners what happens when they go up against the Minutemen. Garvey hoped that the effort to expel the Gunners would help forge a national identity in the minds of Commonwealth residents, as well as to make it clear to potential rivals such as the Brotherhood of Steel that the Commonwealth now had a military to contend with. In late 2287, the United Settlements of the Commonwealth met within the Massachusetts State House while it was being repaired and debated whether they should go to war with the Gunners. While the government argued, Colonel Garvey used supplies and funds provided by Good Neighbor to begin recruiting, training, and building up forces for the possible coming war. After three months of debate, the government finally agreed to set a deadline of September 1, 2288 for the Gunners to completely withdraw from the Commonwealth or face possible military consequences. The Brotherhood was approached and asked to contribute to this effort. They formally declined as they already had too many obligations in the Commonwealth and the Capital Wasteland to take on another enemy. Unofficially however, Brotherhood supply crates would sometimes become lost near Minutemen bases. Minutemen officers were sometimes seen at Boston Airport carrying loads of maps and papers and spending long hours in conference with senior Brotherhood tacticians. Dubbed Operation Righteous Cause, 32 different settlements across the Commonwealth would contribute over 500 Minutemen and materiel, in the largest military concentration in the Commonwealth since the Great War. The Minutemen war plan was to first launch a simultaneous series of ambushes across the Commonwealth to degrade the Gunners' offensive capabilities. Once the Gunners were weakened, full-scale operations against the main Gunner bases would begin a few days later. However, the operation would be anything but simple. All across the Commonwealth the Gunners had a powerful contingent of troops stationed at 13 different sites. These sites ranged from simple observation posts to fortified fire bases, to full-sized bases boasting supplies, vertibird access, and even military-grade robots. The observation posts scattered across the Commonwealth would watch for any imminent threats to the gunners, and could contact fire bases to scramble troops to respond. Major threats would be dealt with by the main bases, including the well-fortified GNR Plaza in the Southern Commonwealth. Apart from the Castle and Boston Airport, GNR Plaza was the most heavily defended site in the Commonwealth region. In addition to the bases, roving patrols of gunners could be found wandering the Commonwealth looking for victims to rob, kill, or kidnap. All told, the gunners could count on what was estimated to be over 350 troopers, including battle-hardened veterans. The first preliminary target would be the powerful radio tower atop GNR Plaza. Not only could this tower contact and coordinate defenses with other gunner outposts, but it could also call in gunner reinforcements from outside of the Commonwealth area. The second preliminary targets of Operation Righteous Cause would be the roving gunner patrols and the observation posts. Destroying these would effectively blind the gunners at the larger bases as well as eliminate a significant portion of the gunners' strength. For months, Minutemen scouts had secretly stalked and observed gunner patrols and observation posts across the Commonwealth region. 
These scouts map the regular gunner patrol routes as well as the habits of the troops at the observation posts. On the night of September 1st, six squads of Minutemen, each with trained snipers, approach gun observation posts. Their job is to sneak up and silence these posts before they could radio warnings to gunner fire bases in the nearby area. Meanwhile a special squad of Minutemen using stealth boys and missile launchers approached Gunner Plaza in the southern Commonwealth region. Their target was the massive communications tower, on the roof of the building. Destroying this would hinder the gunner's ability to coordinate their defenses and launch counter-attacks. The main Minutemen forces could then attack and liquidate the various gunner patrols wandering the Commonwealth without gunner reinforcements showing up. At precisely 3.30 on the morning of the 1st, the squad of Minutemen assigned to the GNR antenna, opened fire and began the war. Explosions damaged the antenna, power generators, and other transmitting equipment on the roof. The squad then moved a safe distance away to fire a green flare into the night sky. This signaled their success to nearby Minutemen forces. The six observation posts were then all neutralized by sniper fire before they could react and alert the fire bases. All across the Commonwealth region, squads of Minutemen opened fire on their unsuspecting targets. Scores of gunner troops fell within the first few hours without any Minutemen casualties. With their initial targets neutralized, Minutemen squads then moved on to designated rally points to concentrate their strength for their next set of targets, the fire bases. As dawn broke, artillery positions located in the north and south of the Commonwealth prepared to fire. Minutemen spotters placed near the firebases radioed in last-minute range corrections to the artillery batteries and requested fire to commence. At the mass bike firebase, the artillery barrage was mostly ineffective due to the heavy concrete roads protecting the gunners from overhead. However, the noise from the artillery fire provided cover for the Minutemen platoons to climb the roadways and attack the firebase from two different directions at the same time. Over the next few hours, the base was silenced. At the underground Vault 75 fire base, the bombardment would be ineffective against the well-built underground vault. Instead, it was decided to use artillery to collapse the building on top of the vault door to seal the gunners inside. The Minutemen would then wait until the garrison was sufficiently weakened by a lack of supplies. Some Minutemen scouts were left behind to monitor the vault in case the gunners tried to dig their way out. At the fire base established in Vault 95, the surface emplacements that the gunners had built were completely wrecked, and the defenders were forced back into the doorway of the vault. The situation became a stalemate as the defenders could not break out, but neither could the Minutemen forces get into the vault. A pair of Minutemen platoons were left in place to keep the gunners here at bay. By the evening of the 1st, Colonel Garvey was generally pleased with the progress of the operation so far. All the observation posts had been destroyed, three of the four fire bases were neutralized, and several gunner patrols had been ambushed and wiped out. Already some gunner recruits were surrendering to Minutemen forces or deserting their units and making their way out of the Commonwealth region. Garvey felt that if he just continued applying pressure, that the rest of the plan would continue yielding results. On the other side of the conflict, the gunner commanders were now fully aware of what was happening. Survivors from the patrol ambushes streamed into the remaining bases with harrowing stories of overwhelming Minutemen attacks. The damaged antenna on top of GNR Plaza was patched up and the gunner commanders began to plan a counter-strike. They decided to gather forces from GNR Plaza, Quincy, Hub City, and Mass Bay Medical to launch a counter-strike at the most obvious Minutemen target, the castle. Early on the 2nd, the four columns of gunner troops would head out separately and meet just west of the castle. The column from Hub City found landmines on the Gibson Pier Bridge leading south. They had to spend two hours clearing the bridge. Then at Reeve Marina they found Minutemen snipers blocking their path. Although the gunners fought their way past the snipers, the gunner commander saw that they would be extremely late to the battle and decided to turn back. The units coming from Mass Bay Medical were harassed all along the route south by Minutemen squads. Finally, just north of Andrew Station the column was turned back by heavy artillery fire coming from the castle. The main column from GNR Plaza, 
was delayed for several hours at Roxbury Station after they ran into a super mutant nest. This left the unsupported column from Quincy to attack first on the morning of the second. This attack was easily repulsed. The GNR column finally arrived in the early afternoon and together with the Quincy survivors launched a second attack which also failed. The gunners then decided to set up camp and besiege the castle. Around 2 in the morning on the 3rd of September, a relief force of Minutemen troops arrived from the west and broke the siege. The gunners made an orderly withdrawal back south but left behind many casualties. The Minutemen spent the rest of the 3rd and 4th of September resupplying, reorganizing, and ferrying troops up north to begin reducing the main gunner bases one by one. The first target would be the Hub City base on the 5th of September. At Hub City, a large artillery barrage from the coastal cottage, Slonk, and Finch batteries kept the defenders pinned for several hours while Minutemen troops positioned themselves. After the artillery fire ended, the Minutemen sent in unarmed Protectron robots as decoys to draw out the fire base's assaultron robot. The tactic worked and the Assaultron robot left the safety of the base to engage the Protectrons at close range. What it did not see were the missile teams hidden in the nearby hills waiting for it to get closer. The missiles wrecked the Assaultron, and with the base defenses severely weakened, a wave of Minutemen troopers emerged from cover to overrun the base. On the 6th, the focus of operations turned to Mass Bay Medical. As the fortress was located in a built-up area, the Minutemen could not use artillery strikes. Instead, sniper teams were put in place all around the building and kept the defenders pinned down. Meanwhile, three platoons of Minutemen moved in at street level, and two platoons used the elevated streets and monorails to approach from above. Even with a distinct advantage in numbers, the fight for the medical complex became a brutal room-to-room -room struggle with the entrenched gunner troops. The Minutemen took several casualties but slowly trapped the garrison in a small pocket on the upper floors. Finally, as the sun was setting, the gunners were forced out onto a rooftop patio. The remaining troopers began to surrender, but rather than give up, the gunner commander opted to jump to his death below. Back at the castle headquarters, the battle plan was coming off almost to perfection. In accordance with the plan, the Minutemen troops shifted to the Southern Commonwealth on the 7th and were allowed a day of rest on the 8th to prepare for the assault on Firebase Quincy. The Brotherhood of Steel, seeing that the gunner threat was greatly reduced finally began to take a more active role in the conflict. They used their Vertibird fleet to ferry Minutemen and supplies south. Colonel Garvey left the castle to personally oversee the assault on Quincy. Garvey had a personal score to settle with the gunners there. Years earlier his unit had been destroyed by the gunners working with a Minutemen traitor at the infamous Quincy Massacre. He wanted to be there to make sure that neither the gunner commanders nor the traitor escaped justice. Just before dawn on the 9th, the mortar batteries at the Jamaica Plain and Murkwater settlements began shelling the Quincy fire base, while storming parties waited east and north of the city. A blocking force of Minutemen waited west of the town in case the gunner garrison at GNR Plaza sent reinforcements. Under a creeping artillery barrage, Minutemen forces stormed the town all at once. Led by the 1st Minutemen Armored Infantry, the Minutemen forces shredded the remaining gunner defenses. Reminiscent of the fight for Mass Bay Medical, the fighting was brutal and took place house to house and rooftop to rooftop. The fighting went on long into the night, but finally the last gunner troops had been liquidated. Garvey confirmed that both gunner commanders and the traitor were dead. The next day, Garvey met with the gunner commander at GNR Plaza to try and negotiate a surrender. He gave the gunners till the evening of the 12th to lay down their arms. This was not just a courtesy, but it allowed him to rest up the Minutemen troops and move additional units south to surround the plaza. On the evening of the 12th, the gunner commander completely rejected the surrender proposal. Just before dawn of the 13th, artillery began raining down on the plaza from the Jamaica Plain, Murkwater, and Somerville batteries. The artillery continued till the afternoon when the barrage was lifted for a Brotherhood Vertibird to survey the damage. They determined that gunner troops remained outside the building and recommended another day of shelling before beginning the main assault. The next morning a gunner vertibird flying in from the southwest, attempted to break the siege of the plaza. Heavy small arms fire from Minutemen positions drove it off. 
The Vertibird returned to the southwest and was not seen again. While GNR Plaza was being besieged, the gunner commander at Vault 95 took stock of the situation. He knew that Hub City and Mass Bay Medical were gone, and that Vault 75 had gone silent. He heard the roar of cannons at Quincy on the 9th and could now see the distant flashes of gunfire at the plaza. He knew that the Minutemen would come for them next. Just before dawn on the 13th the gunners at Vault 95 took the opportunity to break out of their siege and headed west out of the Commonwealth region. Brotherhood Vertibirds harassed them all the way to the western Massachusetts border. On the afternoon of the 13th, the artillery barrage was lifted, and storming parties went in to clear out the remaining defenders. Fierce room-to-room -room fighting took place for most of the afternoon. Late in the day the remaining gunners finally began surrendering. A party of Minutemen raised the Minutemen flag over the building that evening. Vault 75 remained buried for two weeks after the fall of GNR Plaza. A team of laborers excavated the entrance and Minutemen troops were assembled to storm the vault. Once the storming parties entered the vault, they ran into a foul stench and found that everyone inside had died. The air filtration system for the vault had failed and all the gunners had suffocated days after the vault was buried. 41 gunner bodies were recovered from the vault. The incident remained controversial as some in the local press speculated that the Minutemen knew that this might happen. The destruction of the gunners in the Commonwealth not only removed a dangerous threat, but also made it clear to other groups in the wasteland that the Commonwealth was now a sovereign nation with a formidable military. In time the Commonwealth would grow, as caravans of settlers from all across the wasteland flooded in seeking opportunities in a safe law-abiding nation. More importantly the war to eradicate the gunners instilled a national identity into all the settlements in the region. They now belonged to something greater than themselves. This new nation would one day play a vital role in changing the course of history of the new North America.